Don't feel like going home, but all my cash is gone. Yeah, I got nothing to do tonight. Go big or go. Go big or go home. 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 It's getting crazy. We're gonna do some things that we won't forget. Go big or go home. Good morning, North Point. Good morning. Good to see ya. I want to take a moment. I want to. Would you all help me? Whatever campus we have, four campuses that are joining together right now, and those online as well. Um, but we have our Republic campus, our Dream Center campus, our Nixie campus, and our Springfield campus. So today, what if you all welcomed everyone? I'll give you three seconds to just go crazy for the other campuses. Ready, set, go. That. I'm get, that's how I'm going to do it from now on. I like that. I, welcome to North Point. It's my wife, Leanne. If you haven't met Leanne, this is Leanne. Thank you. So, Good to be here. Yeah. We wanted to uh, kind of reflect a little bit on last weekend. So yes. we've been talking about it. We have been talking about it. We should we've tell been, them. We should. Yeah, yeah, do so it. that's what we're going to do. I just want to say, we just want to say a huge, huge thank you. Yeah. For last weekend, it was an incredible Easter weekend at North Point. We... Honestly, we had more people show up at North Point, the North Point campuses, than we ever have in the 12 years we've been here. Yeah. Um, but the really big thank you, because that was awesome, but the big thank you is to the nearly 700 people that volunteered their time, now, time to out. make sure. 700. Yeah, that's a lot. Like if you were like inviting your neighborhood over for dinner and you barbecued and 700 of them showed up, that's a lot of people, right? So yeah. I graduated in a class of 25. That's a lot. Of, I was taught 50% too. That's, that's a lot wow, of people. that's amazing. 700. Impressive yeah. though. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Just dropped that in. That was important. Uh-huh. Anyway, it's not about me. It's about, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, thank you for that. We had so many Kid Point volunteers, because there was hundreds of kids yeah. come in, thousands actually, yep. come in, and we, that's not easy, right? But the, the people in the Kid Point made a, a better view of Jesus for kids, and they also allowed the parents to come in here and get a no distraction service so that they could hone in on Jesus, yeah. and uh, we had greeters making sure people felt welcome. We had coffee people that actually probably showed up at 5.30 in the morning to make sure. Um, let's just start with our kid point workers that they were fueled with some coffee to get that going. Yes. But for the rest of us to enjoy that, our production team, there's just so many, so many details. There was a person driving around with a cart stopping by bathrooms um, to make sure that our bathrooms were awesome. And so... Near 700. It's awesome. Yeah. So we're so honored and so grateful to be part of such an awesome community that gets the mission of being a safe place for people to find and follow Jesus and giving people a better view. So Yeah, and so last week we also took an offering. Uh, well, we, it, was, it was the offering. We said, hey, we want to give all of what comes in the buckets this weekend to one of our favorite partners at the Dream Center. And uh, that was awesome. We had was like, awesome. Like thirty-four thousand dollars yeah. came in last weekend, so yeah. that is super exciting. So and, we decided yeah. to split it because that's we didn't do that. No, we kidding. are giving every penny to the Dream yeah. Center. I promise. That's cool. That's cool. Um, hey, if you're newer to North Point though, and uh, maybe maybe from Easter or just this last season, uh, Leanne, just give us quickly a couple. How, how do you how do you plug in and jump on this mission if you're new and looking for some handles? Right. Sometimes it feels overwhelming if you're uh, at a bigger campus and there's tons of people. It feels, how are we supposed to get connected? We want to make it easier. We want to connect with you because that's how we build the community and get uh, just it's awesome to just be connected with people. So if you are somebody that has shown up and you're like, I want to get connected, but it feels big. Um, we have ways. So groups, we have, if you go on your North Point Mo app that we have, we have groups for every different campus that we have that you can join up and be a part of that. That's a great way. Another great way is to be part of the serving community like we just talked about. That's a, 
There's no better conversations that you can have in a kid point room or door greeters. Just a great way to get to know people. So take advantage of that. Be a part of the community. Be a part of this mission um, of providing a safe place for people to find and follow Jesus. Awesome. Yep. All right. Okay. You can, well, you can stay up here and do oh, this. I'm good. Okay. All right. All right. Well, great. Well, hey, uh, man, we'd love for you to, to find your spot in the mission. Matter of fact, I talked to some people this weekend. They're married, and they met while serving in the Kid Point area. I'm like, how have we not marketed that, right? Like, you're hanging out with kids. I'm hanging out with kids. Maybe we can do this for the rest of our lives, right? That, you know, so, um, but hey, glad to have you here wherever you're joining us. However, I'm thrilled about this series that we're starting today, How Not to Save the World which is actually a series on how to save the world, but we're doing it from a reverse knot. Um, and, and today we're going to talk about this idea of go big or go home. Now, when I say go big or go home, I realize that I should not ever ask that question, go big or go home or challenge someone, because most of us would be like, if given the option, I'll just go home. Right? Like, and, um, so, but I want, us to, I want us to think about one of the things, if we're going to have a big impact, and this guy is going to represent the big impact in our life, is we need to realize that the biggest impacts are often started by a very small step. And a small step can knock down a big obstacle. And we're going to talk today about this idea of having an impact in saving the world. Uh, now, when I grew up, I uh, ended up going to Bible college in Seattle, uh, and, and I'm there, and I remember getting out of college as a youth pastor, thinking I'm ready, like, uh, and I had this prayer, uh, Jesus, help me to change the world. I'm thinking this, big obstacle, and this is me, and I'm like, Jesus, Help me to change the world. And, and I'm, I'm 21 years old, fired up. And honestly, it wasn't arrogance, but it was confidence. I'm thinking, God, I'm allowing you on this great opportunity because I'm planning on changing the world. I just want to do it with you, right? Like, that was nice of me. And, and after I'm doing that, I don't know if you've been to North Idaho. That's where I was a youth pastor, Coeur d'Alene. Um, after, after probably several days, I realized this is too big of an obstacle for me to take on. Like the world? I, I don't know, like, and so I changed my prayer. Instead of Jesus helped me to change the world, I was like, Jesus helped me to change North Idaho. Because that seemed less, right, like less daunting. And, and Kootenai, let's start with Kootenai County. And, and so, like, if we can make a, a solid impact on Kootenai County, that would be great. After I've been doing that for a while, I realized I don't know that I, little Domino Jeremy, have the ability to knock down Kootenai County. So finally, I, I just, my, the longer I was trying to do something for God, my prayer just got shorter and shorter. Instead of Jesus helped me to change the world and Jesus helped me to change Kootenai County, now it's just Jesus helped me to change. Like I know like I'm not able to make this happen. And now that I've been doing it for a long time, I'm just like, Jesus help me. That's like what I say every single day. And I want to talk about this idea. If, if we're challenging everyone to go big, you can't, like you, 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 you realize Ah, earmuffs, eye muffs, you didn't see, that's the reverse. All these good things you wanted to do come, isn't that just like Satan, old slewfoot? He'll do that. Oh, my word. I should have this illustration down by now. Okay, okay. So here's the deal. Now, those of you who are at least enge engineering uh, uh, majors or maybe you've ever played with dominoes, you're going to have to really pretend you've never seen this. And you're like, help me. You, you're like, how will this ever, you're not going to believe. This is like, like, this is like a magic shell, uh, but it's not. It's not like sorcery. This is like, this is, you know. Anyway, so I want you to just kind of go back to this thought of how could I, this little domino, ever have this, you're never going to believe what happens. Watch this. When you say, what if I, instead of trying to take on something huge, just take my simple next step. Cameras, are we ready for this? Because I want all campuses to see this. This is going to be blow your mind. Watch this. Watch this. As, how's Springfield? Are they still? Are they done? Okay. Um, okay, so I, I'm not going to, someone said do it again. No, you never do it twice. You never do it twice. Unless you accidentally did it twice today. But, um, Okay, so here's it. We all understand this, this idea. 
Um, but I want us to talk about go big or go home. It's not about going big or going home. And I wrote it down this way in my notes. I don't have to do something impressive to do something impactful. I don't need to do something that people are like, whoa, do it again, do it again, do it again, to maybe have a big impact. I just have to do something we all understand is true. Just take your next step and trust that God has lined everything and he's using all these variables, all these conversations, all these life circumstances that if you are aware of, looking alive for, and active in your next step, big obstacles come falling down, but you have a big, a big step to play. Don't worry about trying to do something impressive. You can have an impact in your importance just by taking your next step. And today I want to talk about this idea of evangelism. Now, if you grew up going to church, you've been around church for a while, you understand this word. It's not emotionally neutral. I grew up uh, in a church environment. And so evangelism, uh, I understood early on, meant me telling others about my faith. Evangelism breaking down is sharing with others good news. Some of you are natural evangelists. Like if you're excited about something, everyone's got to be excited about it. You post about it. You tell everybody about it. You, you bought this kind of car now. You think everyone should get this kind of car. You, I, I, I know some of you are like that. That's why I used to be an evangelist about stuff I liked. And, and like my favorite restaurants, I'd tell everybody. Now I don't tell anybody my favorite Mexican restaurant. Because like, then you all show up there on Friday and it takes me forever to get in. Okay, But, but, but some of us are naturally like, I want to share with you good news, right? Um, and, but, but growing up, when it's attached to your faith, uh, I went uh, to, to Northwest uh, College, and it's Bible College, and, and I took this class, and I've shared this story several times. So if you've been to North Point any length of time and you don't remember this story, that's hurtful, okay? Um, but but let, me, let me hit this story again. Okay, the, this story of going to college, taking a class, uh, and it was an evangelism class. And um, so, so as I'm there is, is we, would, we would learn these different techniques and pathways to lead someone to Christ. And that seems daunting. I, maybe for you, you leave three people to Christ by Thursday, and that's awesome. Um, but for me, I'm like uh, telling someone about my faith. And, try, and so the class teaches us the Roman road, okay? If you can learn these four scriptures in Roman, Romans, then all of a sudden, the, the most fiercest of agnostics are going to turn to Christ. And, and so we learned a couple different pathways, and we call it evangelism. And then we would partner up. We'd be like, okay, now we got a role play. And so, so we would take two Bible college students, and we would pick who is the heathen and who is the holy one. And and, and so then we would lead each other to Christ. And I honestly had a pretty good record. I was leading people to Christ left and right in my Bible college class. And whenever it was my turn to role play the heathen, I tried to make it tough for them. But then they would pull out that one verse of Romans and next thing I know, my wall comes crashing down. And so we had this nailed and I was getting an A in class. And then our final project is we took a Northwest Bible College van to UW, University of Washington. It's not a Bible college. It's not even a liberal arts Christian college. It is a real heathen university. <laughs> and they dropped us off. Larry Malcolm drops us off in this van and, and says, you have to lead someone to Christ in the next three hours. And that's like our final project. I'm like, I, I haven't led someone to Christ in the first 19 years. I don't think the next three hours is going to. And, and I remember like walking around. I've never been on a real university before. And I'm so intimidated. I'm like, this is not good. And, and I tried. But the problem is these guys hadn't taken my evangelism class. They didn't know how to role play. And so they were asking questions I was ill prepared to answer. And, and they weren't, to my astonishment, falling down with their spiritual obstacles. Matter of fact, I had a sneak off. Off campus, um, right is downtown Seattle, real close to downtown Seattle. Fortunately, there's a homeless camp that is right there, and enough of the guys there were inebriated and very, very helpful to help me on this path. And within three hours, I was able to get someone to say yes. And uh, I don't know if they say yes all the time or if that was an impactful uh, moment. And today, he's traveling the world and saying, if I ever find that young man who led me to Christ right there, um, I, probably not. But, but I remember thinking, man, this is daunting. How do I say, how do I say I'm going to share my faith when it seems like there's no way I can knock this wall down because it's too big? I'm small. The project's big. 
But Jesus can take your little and he can make it enough. That's what we see when it comes to sharing your faith. As we talk about how not to save the world, it's not about trying to convert everybody. It's really trying to reflect that which we've received. If Jesus has shown you love, forgiveness, acceptance, grace, then you just reflect that. And I have to always evaluate what part of my life is not reflecting it truly. And let me invite Jesus and the Spirit of God to shape me. And what part of my, what part of my life is reflecting and just lean into that. And then my role to help impact the world. And it says in Scripture, we're the salt of the earth, which means we are to bring flavor and perseverance to the place that we've been placed how am I doing? How, how do I taste? What's my aroma like? How am I living as a follower of Jesus? Now, I also realize not everyone uh, at North Point has made a decision to follow Jesus, but I would bet everybody, whether you've made a decision or you've not, if you think about it, God uses people for you to understand him better. For you, you can probably think of a couple of people who because of their relationship with you, you're more open to a conversation about Jesus. For some of you who have said yes to Jesus, you know there's a couple of people that you eternally will be thankful for because God used them to open up your heart. And for some of you, you, you don't even know what you're going to do with, with, with Jesus and you're exploring it. But the fact that you're even open to it is because there's some people who you're like, I just can't dismiss you. You're just a really good person and, and I'm, I'm interested in the conversation, right? And so I want to talk about what would it look like if thousands of North Pointers seasoned the area we live, that we lived in such a way where maybe we could have an impact on the world, not by trying to take on something super big, but by taking our next step, even if it doesn't feel impressive. So we're going to walk through that. Now, in order, uh, I wrote down this way, it's easier to experience God's love when the followers of Jesus express God's love. It's easier for those around us to experience God's love when we express it. If we are, I mean, I know that's not rocket science, right? When, when we express love, when we are loving, that's how people feel loved. When we are caring, that's how people feel cared. When we are forgiving, when we are generous, when we are grateful, all these things, when we take the attributes of God and we flesh them out, that's what God did through his son Jesus. He didn't send us a program. He didn't send us a book. He didn't send us an a, a, a employee manual. He, he, sent his, uh, he sent his son to live and flesh out what love looks like. And so we're, we're, we're going to walk through that today. Now, Jesus refused to use shame as an evangelistic uh, strategy. I think judgment and shame are a poor standard. Um, uh, this, this weekend, yesterday morning, uh, I, was, I, I was coming home from an errand, opened the garage door, and uh, my, my youngest daughter was in the garage, and Millie, she had left the door open, Millie came into the garage. When the garage door goes, goes up, Millie runs outside. Now, we don't have a fence, okay? And I am now a dog guy. And I also realize it's not good when Millie gets out without a collar. We don't have one of those electric, you know, deals. And, and Millie and I, she doesn't sense the authority in my life when I tell her to stop. And so I know this is a bad thing. I'm like, okay, this could take forever for us to get Millie uh, back. And, and, and it is bad. Well, at that same time as Millie's running in our front yard and I'm trying to corral Millie, um, all of a sudden our neighbor decides that's the time for his walk with his dogs. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Because this guy, he's like the dog whisperer. He's the kind of guy who always gives us tips about how to help our dog, but not the kind of tips that you're like, hey, that's a thoughtful tip. It's, it's, he's super nice about it, but you can also tell he's like, these suckers don't have a clue what they're doing. And what's annoying is he's right. And so, so he's walking his dog. He's coming and Millie sees the dog. I'm like, no, this is is terrible. And Millie just starts running and yapping and nipping and circling and running. And his dog is just like, you know, and he's like showing off with commands and calm and the dog's just responding. And I'm like, okay, Millie, this is, you're embarrassing me. 
okay? And I don't know if you've ever owned a dog or a kid, but you know what it's like publicly where you're not allowed to, to, to express the threats, but you're trying to help give them cute clues and you hope they pick up that this ain't gonna be good as soon as I'm allowed to reach you, right? And I'm like, hey, Millie, we don't do that. <laughs> no, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, we don't do that, Millie. Or she, That's not the way to meet friends, Millie. And then I'm like, Millie Ponopee Johnson, I'm gonna beat your butt as soon as we... I'm, I'm like everything I, and so we finally get her inside, and, and, uh, and I'm like, Millie, and so I'm just using judgment and shame. I'm like, Millie, you embarrassed our family out there today. And I'm like, Millie, I'm showing her the crate. Look at that crate. Do you want to be in the crate? I want to put you in the crate, and I'm thinking of doing it, Millie, naughty, naughty doggy. And I could tell Millie knew what I'm saying, and I sat her down on my lap. I didn't put her in the crate. I just like to threaten, right? And so, um. But, but some of us, we think, like, man, that's, that's, that's what Christianity is. And when we do something bad, it's like threat and judgment. And a lot of times as Christians, that's how we act towards other people. Like, I can't believe you all do this. You all go into hell in a handbasket. Can't wait for you to get there, right? And, and we're just like, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to be a human, and I can't believe what's going on. And Lord, protect us now from all these idiots you created and 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 we have this mentality and we're like huh I wonder why that's I wonder why those walls ain't coming down right I wonder why those walls ain't coming and that's not what Je- Jesus did matter of fact let me before we go there I was I'm in a, I'm in a text thread and, and this week I got sent an article that I'm like oh it was an article about church and it said this, and I know we've had a lot of people uh, talking and writing about the rise of the religious nuns, and some of you are like, man, it sounds like one of those scary Catholic gangs, okay, that, that, not, not that kind of nun, okay, uh, meaning people who say, I have no affiliation, my affiliation is none, that kind of gang. And, so, um, and so, so that's been a big deal, but one of the things that was written uh, from the Atlantic, I'd just like to drop that out because it makes it sound like I read the Atlantic, but I didn't even know the Atlantic was an article um, until someone sent it to me. But anyway, I read it, and the survey says... Uh, Uh, that more than 25% of Americans in this most recent survey say they're either atheist, agnostic, uh, or uh, religiously non-affiliated. That's the highest percentage since they've been doing these kind of surveys in America's history. Over one out of four people, more than one out of four people would say, I'm not into God at all, and if I am into God, I'm certainly not into faith, uh, any type of community, because I don't want to associate with them. And there's a couple of ways we can look at it. And we'd be like, well, you guys are idiots, and we don't want you anyway, right? Um, and, and the other opportunity to look at that is like, what about followers of Jesus is so um, repulsive that some who are even saying, I want a relationship with God. I just don't know where to find some traction because it certainly ain't that. That's not an expression I jive with. I'm like, man. Matter of fact, they they said this in in this article. It it said, no faith's evangelism has been as successful in this century as religious skepticism. And meaning this, if you take all those affiliations that they did in the survey, like Catholics and Protestants, and they could break it down even further with different mainline or charismatic, different, different types of, of faith. If you look at that as a whole, there's not one of those categories that is exploding. The only one that seems to have a revival is the category that says, no, thank you. And I look at that and say, man, what if we're getting this wrong? What if we're not doing this like Jesus? Because Jesus seemed to melt hearts and draw people. So I want us to look in this series. And again, we're not going to solve it today, but hopefully we tease it today. In this series, I want to look at what would it look like if I joined on mission with Jesus, positioned myself to be in the right spot, And that God would align my actions, my interactions, my conversations in such a way that he would be able to knock down some big walls. Here's what Jesus did. Matthew chapter 9. 
In Matthew 9, a little background is, is he's got one of his disciples. This is before his disciple was a disciple. It's how Jesus invited him into this journey. His name is Matthew or Levi. And, and, and if you've watched The Chosen, he's my second favorite character in The Chosen. <laughs> um, uh, Jesus is number one because I'm like that. And so, um, but anyway, uh, in, in Matthew, he's a tax collector. And in that culture, it's really like tax collectors were known as the biggest sellouts, not only morally, but politically. And, and as a matter of fact, they would call them, they would brand them as when they would say Jesus surrounded himself with sinners and then they would say not just sinners but tax collectors and people would be like ooh like tax collectors are known as so off limits spiritually that when prostitutes would see a tax collector they'd get all judgy like ooh watch out tax collector and so that's what we see in scripture that always be called out and so here's what we see in Matthew chapter 9 it says Jesus went on from there he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth it was in the lobby of a Walmart and he says follow me he told him, and Matthew got up and followed Jesus. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, while Jesus was having dinner, they're having a barbecue. Well, probably not, they're Jewish, but I mean, the tax collector wasn't really that Jewish. Um, they're, ha- they're, having, they're having a meal together. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came in ate with he and his disciples. Side note, that's crazy. Jesus, his strategy wasn't Judgey McJudgerson, I'm gonna send you to the crate if you don't shape up. Jesus' strategy was like, soup's on, come on. Appetizers are ready, there's room for you. This is Jesus, this rogue rabbi who's his religious teacher who's all of a sudden hanging out with the worst of the worst, a tax collector, and it's going so badly that a ton of tax collectors feel comfortable there. TMZ is popping out of the hedge bushes, taking pictures for their next uh, uh, magazine. And here's what it says. The Pharisees saw it. They asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing it, Jesus said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I've not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call sinners. Now when Jesus says this, when he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, the moral of the story is there's no sacrifice needed. Because the truth is we've all sinned, and Scripture says it very clearly, the wages, the hard-earned paycheck of my sin is death. There is a sacrifice needed. So when he says, I don't desire sacrifice, I desire mercy, he's not saying there's no sacrifice. He's saying, I don't need it from you. That's why I came. I deliver the sacrifice. I am the sacrifice. I am the Lamb of God who lays down his life for the world. I don't need you to lay down your life. I came to give you life. So much life is overflowing. I desire mercy because I am the sacrifice. And he doesn't say that I don't want you to be righteous. He says that, listen, your righteousness is not enough. I came to be a spiritual solution because none of our righteousness measures up. And so I came to be right. Now, some of you would say, okay, the moral of the story, Jesus went to a very inappropriate place. You're like, you know, what business does Jesus have going to a party with a bunch of tax collectors? Well, Jesus had no business going there except that was his actual business is to go with people who are broken and connect and be with them. And some of you are going to be all inspired and be like, okay, I'm going to go to the most seedy establishment in Springfield Metroplex tonight. And on the count of three, we'll all call out where we think that is. I'm just (laughs) just kidding. (laughs) Um, But you're like, that's it. I want to be like Jesus. And then if people talk bad about me and they hate on me because I'm going there, I'll be like, what up? Jesus did the same thing, yo, right? Like that's not the moral of the story. Jesus was able to go to very unhealthy environments because he did it from a place of stability and health. Let's not skip that little one, okay? Let's just say like today's the day that you have like a two-day streak from alcoholism and you're set free two days. Don't go to the bar tonight just because you love the taste of pretzels, okay? That's not the moral, for real, that's not the moral of the story. The moral of the story is not to go to some crazy environment because that's what Jesus would do. The moral of the story is I wanna be so healthy and so on mission and so filled with the spirit of God that no matter where I go, I'm gonna have an impact. They're not gonna drag me down. I'm gonna bring them up. It's because 
because I am there from health, out of health for his glory. So one moral of the story is let's get as healthy as we can so that we can go anywhere he calls us to go. Um, but but here, here's, here's the deal. Followers of Jesus, we don't have a mandate to convert. We have an invitation to converse, to talk with people. That's it. To share our lives with people. Go big or go home, that's daunting. How about this? Let's follow the ways of Jesus. Did Jesus stand up there and say, listen, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You all suckers are going to hell unless you follow me. Jesus would say those kind of things, but to a different audience. To this audience, Jesus is like, pass the gravy, please. That stuff's good. And his invitation was to converse. And by spending time with them, drawing them, knowing that God has set up some things. And, and sometimes we get so focused on the big obstacle that we miss out on God's role for our own life. Here's what we see. It's easier to talk to your friends about Jesus. Like if I have to choose, go talk to a stranger at Costco today or my friends. Like I'm, going, I'm going friends all the time. Like Costco, that's weird, man. Like, hey, that's cool. I mean, if, if you feel like hey, that's, that's you, you can do that, okay? But like, if I'm having to choose, that feels very unnatural. It's rare. I've got to feel very strongly with an impulse that I should, uh, I should approach somebody I don't know with a, a big spiritual conversation. Um, but I could talk to my friends. And so if, the, if that's true, then the key is just make a bunch of friends. If it's easier to talk to your friends about Christ, then the key watching Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 is just make a whole bunch of friends. Walk around with your AirPods out. Take walks in the neighborhood just because it's a great opportunity for you to engage in conversation. Leave your dog at home, though, because I'd take them off, right, if your dog behaves like mine. Um, uh, join a club. Uh, join a, a PTA. And get involved with the soccer team. Do something to rub shoulders with people to make friends. Because it's hard to make an enemy a follower of Jesus. And it's hard to make a stranger interested in a spiritual conversation that depth with, a, with another stranger. So what if we just made a bunch of friends and that was our mandate was to lean into conversations. Acts chapter 2. And I'm bouncing different scriptures today. Um, and so we're like, if, if you brought like your Bible like, and you're like flipping around, you're gonna get like paper cuts, okay? Uh, so we got on the screen here, but Acts chapter two, I wanna look at uh, verse 46 and verse 47. This is the early church. After Jesus rises from the dead, the church blows up. And, and it says this. It says, uh, every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. How often? Every day. Every day they would meet in the temple courts. And when I say temple courts, don't you think of like temple like, like uh, you know, uh, some church, like Temple Baptist Church or uh, something like that. What that meant is that's a gathering place. That's where they're hanging out, okay? Every day they would see people as they go to and from. And it says they broke bread in their homes and they ate together. Where did they break bread? In their homes. They had mozzarella sticks together. They had soup night together. They had everyone bring a dessert night together. Every day they would see each other and then they would go into each other's houses. They would break bread together um, and they would eat together. And it says, with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of how many people? All the people. And the Lord added to their number weekly, monthly, every Easter, Daily. Those who are being, how does God add daily when we don't have a revival going in our church and under a tent every night? Like, how is that even mathematically possible? If the only way someone could go to, to get to a spot where they surrender to Christ is because they got an invitation from a stranger that left a, an invite instead of a tip at a restaurant and they showed up at our church saying, what meaneth this? And the pastor leads them to the front. And not that that can't happen, though I encourage you to leave an extra tip and then they invite. But, but the thing is, daily, as they were having food together, as they were hanging together, I was talking to Preston Ulmer. A lot of you know Preston, spiritual formations. He said it this way. He says that evangelism travels at the speed of hospitality. And I couldn't shake that thought. Isn't that true in Scripture? 
It seemed that the pace of my relationships seemed to be the vehicle upon which people's hearts were opened. As I look at in scripture, I think that's true in our lives. I've got some people in my life that mean a lot to me that aren't followers of Jesus. And they're not my project. I'm not trying to convert them. I want them desperately to hear from Jesus. I want them to hear what I've heard. I want their doubts and their disappointments and their hurt that have made them not open. I want them to, I want those walls to fall down. I do. I pray for it. And I want to have a role in that. But my role is not to convert them because that's daunting. And if it happens, I'll think more highly of myself. And if it doesn't happen, I'll think less. But only God can do that. My job, though not impressive, can be impactful by saying, God, line me up in the right way so that you can use. I don't want to miss this step. I never want to let my ordinary stand in the way of my obedience. I want to make sure that I'm obedient to what God is asking, even if it feels ordinary. Even if it feels like, hey, come watch the game at my house. Even if it feels like, hey, let's go to Cheddar's. Even if it feels something very practical. There are people in your life, you've been positioned, commissioned, positioned in the right spot from God. That if you play your role, they're going to be more open to Jesus. But we've got to be ready. 2 Corinthians says it this way, and this one's nuts, okay? This says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled. Some of you accountants, your antennas just went up, okay? Reconciled, made things right, okay? You can clock out now because it's all been reconciled, right? Spiritually, it's an account, it's a ledger. It's, it's God is in the business of making things right, right? Um, and so he reconciled us um, uh, to himself through Jesus Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, that's fancy talk for you got a job. God gave you a job. You're like, what's my job? I'm assistant reconciler, okay? That's your new job. If you're unemployed, no longer. You're assistant to the reconciler, maybe, okay? Whatever you want it to be, okay? You can work on your business cards later. But our job from God is the ministry or the service or the job of, it's a special appointed God, a job with a special appointed power from the, the boss to be able to help reconcile others to God. That's our job. And that God was reconciling himself to the world, not counting people's sin against them, and he's committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Now make sure you enunciate correctly, okay? But turn to someone near you and say, you're an ambassador. <laughs> I, could, I could get risky right there, okay? An ambassador, as though God were making his appeal through you. We implore you. On whose behalf? God's behalf. On Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. That's your job. That's my job. If you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, <laughs> I hope you understand that's, that's the thing that would make it even more eye-opening if more people in your path were doing this. That might be why you're interested because someone's been doing this. It's not just because they're supernaturally nice. It's because they're on mission. My job is to let God implore others through me as an ambassador. Some of y'all, you know ambassadors. You, you're like, you know brand ambassadors, right? You got social media and TikTok, and they're a brand ambassador. What is a, an ambassador? Let's talk about ambassadors. One, an ambassador is bilingual, okay? It's, it's they, they're representing one land to another land. And so they got to understand both sides of the game, right? Um, uh, an ambassador, I, I put down a few things. One, as an ambassador, I must learn the words and the ways of my homeland. That's, that's priority number one. If I'm an ambassador for God, my first assignment is I got to know the words and the ways of God. I need to know the Holly Bible. I need to get it in me. I need to understand it. I need to live it out. I need to every day understand that I am not my own. This world is not my home. I have been sent here with purpose, on purpose, for purpose, and I need to know the ways of Jesus. And now when I've got that, my second job as an ambassador 
It's to know the, the words and the ways of my host land. And that's this world. Instead of being like, oh my word, you're nothing like my, my boss. Just be like, okay, <laughs> this is so different. My job now is to connect the dots. How do I do that? Let me see. I must know your ways. I'm, and it doesn't mean I'm like, that's why we need to start with our homeland. Because otherwise we're like, this land is awesome. Forget my old land. No, no, no. You're an ambassador. Matter of fact, I was, I was researching uh, this week, who is the best ambassador in the history of the United States? And the answer for, from several of the articles was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. He an eclectic, eccentric dude. But he was winsome, and they said that he went to Paris during the American Revolution, and, and the Americans needed resources like crazy, and they had none. And so they send him to Paris as an ambassador, representing Americans, this new country, and going to France, this established power, and saying, can we connect the dots here? And, and he did it in such a way, they loved him. They found him winsome and brilliant, and, and they ended up sending so many supplies to America that helped them win the Revolutionary War. And, and then they, they, they used him, they liked him so much, they used him as ambassador to sign different peace treaties and, and help organize all types of relationships between France and, and America because they loved him. And then I also researched who was the least uh, the least liked ambassador, the worst ambassador in the history of the United States. And a couple articles, and I hate this, if, if you're related to this guy, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just the reporter, okay? It says this, John Adams. <laughs> John Adams, they said, was the worst. Matter of fact, they had sent him to Paris before Ben Franklin. And, and they're like, hey, um, can you go? And, and they said that he was so ill-received. People couldn't stand his attitude, his arrogance. They just didn't like the guy. And a matter of fact, eventually they just sent him back to America and said, we don't want you in our country. <laughs> and so then he became the second president of the United States, uh, which we'll talk about that in November. But bottom line is, um, is, is this idea of an ambassador. What kind of ambassador am I? Does the world look at me and be like, I don't even agree with you, and I know I ain't from your land, but I'm interested in the combo. Keep talking. Or are they like, dude, I don't even want you around. You're repulsive. And sometimes we just say, oh, you just don't like my morality. I don't get it. You can't stand the heat. Stay out of the kitchen, right? It's not a morality. It's oftentimes our attitude, our lack of humility. It says, it says that once uh, the, the, uh, uh, after Jesus had rose from the dead and, and went up to heaven and Christianity was starting to gain some steam, it was a threat to the local powers, the Roman Empire. And so at one point, they have extra biblical literature. It, it, means, it doesn't mean it wasn't true. It's just literature that they have found that wasn't in the Bible. Just some letters from one of the senators of Rome because the emperor had said, I want you to find, round up all the Christians in your area and kill them because they're a threat to the empire. And the senator sent a letter back that they found that says this, I think there must be some miscommunication because <laughs> there is no way you would want to kill all the Christians because the Christians in my area... They're the best citizens there. They're the ones that serve. They're the most generous. They're the most joy-filled. Surely you don't want me to get rid of these people. And even if I did, they're so well-loved by people who aren't even Christians, there would be a riot on my hands if I killed all the Christians. And I wonder, what would people say about us? Are we ambassadors? Not everyone's going to love you. And that's not the goal is that everyone loves you. The goal is that I carry my life in such a way as an ambassador, that I represent the brand, that I represent Jesus in a way where they're more interested in the conversation. And last thing as an ambassador, I must reach new markets. I must be willing to be able to go into areas that aren't open. And instead of looking at this as too big of an obstacle, I say, hey, can I have a conversation and align myself that, God, you're positioning me to be helpful and bringing down a wall. Last thing is this. Um, I want us to, to, to look at this, this, this last point, the outline that I feel like will be kind of our mantra for the series on evangelism, that my greatest witness, the ability to talk about Jesus, my greatest witness might be my witness. 
and witness isn't a real word. It's got a red squiggly on my computer. Um, but my greatest witness might be my witness. My ability to be with somebody might be the number one way that God can use me to help impact other people for eternity. But it requires us to wake up every day and look alive and remember that we're on mission. I've got a job. I'm an ambassador. I can't just get so comfortable in my home and forget that I'm here on purpose. And I can't just get so homesick for my home that I'm not effective in my host land. Every day when I go to work, look alive. Every time I walk in the neighborhood, look alive. Every day I got to wake up and do my time with God, not because I'm more moral now, 73-day streak, look at me. It's because I don't want to forget why I'm here. Spirit of the living God, fill me today. Help me to see what you see. Help me to be positioned. I need to be filled with God's spirit. We have a podcast, number two of our podcast, and I think we're on 150-something, right? But if you go back to number two on the Riff podcast, and if you ask me in the lobby, what is the Riff podcast? It's going to hurt my feelings, okay? Pretend you know it's our podcast. Um, but if you go to the number two, it's five things I wish every North Pointer would make a part of their daily life. And, and, and it, let's, let's, let's soak that in and say every day I want to get time with God. Every day I want to be reminded that I'm being led by the Spirit. Every day I want to have interaction with people who aren't followers of Jesus. I want, I want to go through these practices, right? And so, so let me close with two pictures. One is, and they're baseball pictures. Y'all baseball fans? Oh, man, Nick's is going crazy. Okay, bunch of baseball fans here. Hope that's saving your experience. Okay, I'm going to show you a baseball. Y'all Cardinal fans? Yeah. All right, okay. All right, this will be good. I got a picture, okay? Nolan Arenado. Did I say that right? Or is it Nolan Arenado? Okay, okay, Nolan Arenado. He plays the hot corner, okay? Third baseman for the Cardinals. And look at him. This is what we would call... Ready position in the biz. You see what he's doing? He's got his knees bent, his glove down, his eyes gazed, his, 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 his focus, his, his sunflower seeds all shifted to the left side of his mouth, okay? He is ready. He's ready. What are the odds that that next pitch is going to end up going to Nolan Arenado? Very little. Don't tell Nolan that. He believes, hit it to me, hit it to me, hit it to me, hit it to me. He's one of those players that hopes the hardest hit is right to him because he believe, he's ready. That's not how I play baseball. Here's how I play baseball, okay? This is me, <laughs> right? That's when I played right field, okay? Just sitting there, what if? Like, because I'm like, they're not going to hit it to me. And I'm not the dude that's like, hit it to me, hit it to me. I'm like, please don't hit it to me. Please don't hit it to me, right? And coaches and parents are like, look alive, look alive, look alive, Jeremy. Come on, come on. And I'm like, why? It ain't coming to me. And in the event it did, what am I going to do about it? <laughs> every day, look alive. What if thousands of us every day take a moment and we look alive? And we go to our place of employment, we go to our schools, we go to our neighborhoods. Not with this mandate to convert, this invitation to converse and to be the season with an attitude of humility, with an appetite for gravy. And we sit around tables and we eat and we drink and we talk and we connect and we allow God to use that as one more domino that he uses to knock down any obstacle that gets in the way of us hearing Jesus call our name. I pray today that maybe even if you're not a follower of Jesus, that today would be one of those dominoes in your path. Maybe Jesus is speaking to you today. I hope that's the case. If not, keep leaning in. And for those of you who have made that decision, let's be those people. Let's be winsome. Let's be mission-filled, spirit-filled, and invite Jesus to do some big things, not because we're impressive, because we're obedient we're aware, we're looking alive. So Father, today, I thank you so much that you've loved us, you've reached us. God, you've communicated through others your great love. And I pray today we would be gripped with mission, fueled with purpose, and aware and alive for all the opportunities right in front of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.